Welcome to the Awesome Book Awards 2022. And we're sorry we're unable to welcome you into our school, but we've put together this virtual event for you to enjoy at home. And we very much hope that you've enjoyed reading this year's shortlist. The Awesome Book Awards were set up with the aim of fostering, sharing, and keeping a love of reading and stories, and to help children to understand the processes of writing and publishing books. Storytelling remains a magical realm that inspires our imagination, and the power of books and stories has never been more important. Each year, our panel chooses books by first-time authors, and each year we're delighted by the response from our young readers. Pupils across the South East have sent us reviews and drawings inspired by their favourite reads. And what a special set of books they are. A slip in time that helps children change the future. The mystery behind a skull found in a tree. Ebenezer Tweezer and his beast in the attic. A boy who makes everyone laugh and a delightful retelling of fairy tale classics. Who will win the Awesome Book Awards 2022? Hello, um, this is Thomas Taylor. I'm the winner of uh, last year's Awesome Book Award. Very happy to be here today to um, help unveil this year's winner. Um, my own experience of winning um, the Awesome Book Award last year was pretty exciting, even though um, it had to be done at home because of COVID and everything. Uh, it did lead to some pretty interesting experiences. I've been invited in um, to many, many schools as a result, and I've met many of the children who nominated for my book. Um, so that's been a pretty exciting experience because, of course, the Awesome Book Awards is nominated by um, and chosen by children uh, actually at school. So that's pretty, pretty, been pretty good. Um, and since then, I've been able to write some of the sequels. This is a series I'm creating. So I've been able to it's given me the confidence to, to get on with the, the third book and then the fourth book. And I'm currently writing the fifth book in the series. So Malamanda is actually going to be a five book series. Um, uh, but I'm very, very excited to be here today to help take part in the unveiling of the winner of the Awesome Book Awards 2022. Congratulations on winning the Awesome Book Awards 2021. Thank you so much. That is wonderful. Really, really amazing to have won an award. Always good to win an award. But when the books are chosen by the children themselves, that's very special. So thank you and thank you to everybody involved. Hello, my name's Leslie Parr, and I'm really thrilled to be shortlisted for this book, The Valley of Lost Secrets, for an awesome book award. The Valley of Lost Secrets is a story set just at the beginning of the Second World War, when a lot of children were evacuated to places of safety. My main character, Jimmy, is moved with his little brother, Ronnie, and a girl called Florence and some other children from their school to a place in South Wales. And Jimmy discovers a human skull in a hollow tree and that's the mystery. I wanted to tell a story about how children would react to making a shocking discovery because I think that they would react quite differently to how I would react, for example, as an adult. If I found a human skull in a hollow tree, I know what I would do. I'd phone the police straight away. But I wanted a story where children don't do that. So Jimmy keeps it a secret at first, and then he finds that he can solve the mystery by working with others. As I said, the story takes place in South Wales, and I wanted to share a little bit with you where Jimmy and Ronnie are in their new bedroom. So they're taken in by a really nice couple called Mr. and Mrs. Thomas. And Mr. Thomas is a minor. And Jimmy 
is glad they've been chosen, but he doesn't really want to be there at all. And he's just finding out how different their new home is to where they've come from. So Jimmy and Ronnie have been left in their bedroom and Mrs. Thomas has gone downstairs to let them settle in. From the window, I can see the back garden. It's long, bigger than ours and slopes up to a hedge that meets another garden. It looks a bit like the allotment Grandad used to have with its rows of vegetables and sticks that make a wigwam for runner beans. But Grandad's allotment was flat. Nothing in Llanbrin is flat. Next to their air raid shelter is a pen with a little wooden hut in it. Up above the rows of rooftops are the mountains. They overlap each other, making it impossible to see what's behind them. I suppose it's more mountains, like there's no way out. So this is it, the countryside evacuation. No more getting covered in oil in the garage with Dad. No more Nan telling us off for it. Just other people's biscuits and houses in a single bed. None of it's ours. I turn to Ronnie. He's running his fingers over the candlewick bedspread, tracing patterns in and out of the flowers and leaves. I know he's itching to tug out the fluffy bits. Nan's always telling him off for it. I look around properly. We share at home, but our bedroom's much bigger, big enough to play a really good game of cowboys. Dad let us have it after Mum left, said he preferred to be cosy, but I think he just didn't like it in there without her. Ronnie pulls at the bedspread. No, I yell. He jumps and I feel bad. I sit next to him and put my arm around his shoulders. I'm sorry for shouting, I say, but you can't do that, especially not here. Remember what Nan said? To behave like we do at home. Better. She said we have to behave better so we don't show her up. You don't want to show her up, do you? He shakes his head. I fluff up the candle wick so the gaps don't show. Mrs. Thomas was right. It is soft. This isn't our home, Ronnie. This isn't your bed. This isn't our home. Saying it out loud makes it even worse. I dig my fist into the pillow. Ronnie kneels up on the bed, both of his arms stretched around me. We'll be all right, Jimmy, he says. You can have the bed if you like. I'll sleep on the floor. I don't mind. I have to smile. He thinks I'm upset about the bed. He doesn't get it. He never really gets it. Mum leaving, evacuation, the war. It must be nice to be six and daft. So that's just a little bit of the story to show you how Jimmy's feeling at the very start. And then the skull discovery is surprisingly what makes everything better. Thanks. Bye. My name is Radia Fisa and I'm the author of Remesa, a fairy tale, which is three retellings of Rapunzel, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, except in my version they're called Remesa, Cinderella and Sleeping Sarah. The idea for Remesa came to me one day when I was at work and I had this image of a girl trapped in a tower, sewing away and she was making an escape hijab and I've always loved sort of fairy tales and the adventures and magic that they have in them but I always wondered what it would be like if someone like me was in them. And I'd never really seen that growing up, nor had I seen that recently, so I decided to go ahead and write one myself. So that's what um, Mamesa is really about. It's about a young Muslim girl who goes on adventures and a bit of a reluctant hero, actually, as well, who kind of doesn't know what she's doing, but ends up helping people and realises that that in itself is quite a rewarding thing. And so, yeah, that is what Mamesa is about, really. It's about going on adventures, being your own hero and girl saving themselves. I'm going to do a short reading now and start from the beginning. Once upon a time, in a land quite far away, snow was falling heavily from the dark sky, blanketing the land of Splinterfell in white. It was a night full of promise to some, for the first day of snowfall marked the beginning of winter and the coming of festivities and joy. It was time to shut up windows, spend time with loved ones and retreat from the outside world. Not everybody could take part in such joy though. There were some families who had less than others, and the fall of snow meant a definite end to the hopes of crops and work. There was one family who were particularly less fortunate than others. Naina lived in a little hut on the outskirts of the village and spent her days sewing clothes for wealthier ladies. 
Her husband, Sama, was usually gone for most of the day, trying to find work, but he never had any luck. Some said his bloodline was cursed to poverty. Others cruelly and unfairly whispered that he was a bad worker, so nobody would hire him. When Sama returned home one night, for after another long, hard day of searching for work, his hands were once again empty. Naina began to weep, tired from her day of stitching, with nothing to eat since morning. She feared for her unborn child. There were only two more moons to go until the baby came. Unable to bear seeing his wife so upset, Sama went back outside in search of food. Over the hill, right by the edge of the woods, there was one house to which nobody ventured too close. The dark wooden building was surrounded by different crops and berries in the garden. It was said the witch of Splinterfell lived there, though nobody had ever seen her, and that anyone who stole from a bounteous garden would have to pay a price. What that price was, no one could be sure, but few were willing to take the risk to find out. Sama, however, was desperate. He snuck his way over to the house and slipped in through the large gates that encircled it. Sama felt as though he had stepped into a dream. There were all kinds of fruits and vegetables growing in the witch's garden. He stood in uncertainty for a moment and then began to take as much of the food as he could carry. He ran back to his house, looking over his shoulder all the while. He spotted no sign of the witch nor anybody else. Nana was overjoyed when Sama came home with the food. She turned the vegetables into a stew and they ate merrily with the fruits for dessert. The next evening, Sama returned home again, having had no luck in finding work. He hesitated before entering his house. Through the window, he could see his wife lying in bed, cradling her large stomach. He gazed at her for a moment, making his decision. Sama snuck back into the witch's garden and took all he could carry again. The witch didn't seem to exist, so Sama returned again and again over the next two months, taking whatever food he could find. Nana began to glow with health, and soon enough, the time came for their child to arrive. The birth of Nana and Sama's baby carried on through the night and day. Finally, the baby came screaming into the world. Nana and Sama were weeping and laughing from exhaustion. It was a girl. They called her Remesa. Just as Nana was holding her daughter for the first time, joyfully cradling her and stroking her cheek, a knock sounded on their wooden door. Who is it? Sama called. It is I, came a low voice, the one from whom you have been stealing. Sama froze. The hair on his body stood up. Who is that? Nana asked, clinging her baby tighter to her chest. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Sama cried, frantically searching for some sort of weapon, but their small house was bare. The door swung open with a loud smack to reveal a figure cloaked in black. All they could see of her pale face was dark red lips and a pointy chin. Sama's eyes widened in horror. It was the witch. For two moons you have stolen from my garden, the witch said. Now I have come to take what is mine. She lifted a skeletal finger and pointed at the baby. Hello, my name's Helen Rutter and um, I'm so excited to be shortlisted for the Awesome Book Awards. Um, I am going to read to you a little bit today uh, from The Boy Who Made Everyone Laugh um, and the section I'm going to read to you is it was a really lovely bit to write. It was one of my favourite bits to write, actually. That's why I'm gonna. Why, that's why I chose this section to read to you today. And it's when um, Billy. Um, so if you read the book, you know that Billy Plimpton here wants to be a stand-up comedian. That's his dream. He wants to tell jokes on a stage, but he thinks that his stammer is going to get in the way of achieving that dream. Now, the section I'm going to read is when his new teacher, Mr. Osho, has asked everybody in the class to do a show-and-tell speech that tells everybody a little bit about what who they are. Now, Billy doesn't want to do this at all because he doesn't want everyone to know that he has a stammer. So he comes up with a plan and this is Billy's show-and-tell speech. Yasmin Ori is up before me. She's brought in a photo of her family and is talking about how important her friends are, how they're like her family too. Then she makes a heart shape with her hands at the end. The girls all whoop and clap. I'm still sitting with my cardboard between my knees, trembling with fear. I wish my name wasn't Plimpton. It means that I'm always near the end of the register, so I have longer to worry. Mr Osho waits for Yasmin to sit down and then says, Next up is Billy. He gives me a little wink and starts a round of applause. I stand up and slowly go to the front. I avoid looking at William Blakemore. No plan, however good, will stop him from making me feel nervous. 
Instead, I focus on Mr. Rosho and Skylar because they're smiling at me. I take out my favourite joke book, 999 Jokes for Kids, and hold it up for the class to see. Then I raise my first sign. In big chunky letters, it reads, My name is Billy Plimpton and I have a stammer. I see my hand shaking like it doesn't belong to me. I put down the card and pick up number two and then number three. I brought in a joke book. I love jokes. The room is so quiet. Five more signs to go. Unfortunately, I can't tell you one today. It's hard to tell a joke when you can't get to the end of a sentence. I hear a couple of the girls say, aww, and bless him. The end. I bow and hold up the last two signs. Now you clap and cheer. They're doing it. They're actually clapping. And someone whistles. I look to Mr. Osho. I'm worried that he'll think I've cheated. (laughs) That my signs are only showing and not telling. That he'll ring my mum and tell her that I didn't speak. But he has a big smile on his face and I know it's okay. I hold up my final sign. And I become the coolest kid in the school. Everyone laughs at the last sign. I take another bow and go to my seat. Alex holds his hand up for a high five. And then Josh and Matthew do the same. My head is fizzing and my ears are getting hot. It feels good though. People really laughed. I'm almost relieved. I don't have to hide my stammer anymore. So I hope you enjoyed that section of the story and I'm not going to ruin it and and tell you if Billy achieves his dream and tells his jokes on the stage. You'll have to read it to find that out. Um, But yeah, I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hello, awesome people. From the heart of my bottom, hold on, from the bottom of my heart, I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's got involved with the Awesome Book Awards this year. It's honestly been so wonderful to see so many of you reading such a fantastic selection of books. Uh, My name is Jack Megan Phillips, and my books are The Beast and the Bethany and Revenge of the Beast. It's basically a children's series about a young 500-year-old, a carnivorous beast, and a child who's going to be eaten. This is the opening chapter of The Beast in the Bethany, where something very, very unawesome takes place. Ebenezer Tweezer was a terrible man with a wonderful life. And at the time when this story begins, he was about to do an especially terrible thing. All Ebenezer did at first was bring home a Wintelorian, Purple-breasted parrot. Good morning. My name is Patrick. It's late afternoon. My name is Mr. Tweezer. Welcome to your new home. Whoa! Gosh! Now, the whoa, ho, 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 and the gosh were both the right sorts of words to say because Ebenezer's house was nothing short of extraordinary. Can I come out of my cage now? Asked Patrick. Not yet, answered Ebenezer. Um, There's someone I want you to meet first. Well, um, something is perhaps a better description. Ebenezer climbed the stairs whilst Patrick took in all the beautiful things around him. Try not to be scared, said Ebenezer, once they reached the top floor. This thing... I won't like you if you are scared. Ebenezer pushed down the handle of the rickety old door at the top of the stairs. It opened with a creak. The room was not like the rest of the house at all. It was damp and smelled strongly 
of boiled cabbage. The room was bare, save for a set of red velvet curtains. Ebenezer drew these curtains open and revealed the beast. The beast with a big blob of grey with three black eyes, two black tongues, and a large dribbling mouth. Good morning! My name is Patrick. It's late afternoon. <laughs> the beast's voice was soft and slithery, like a snake made of feathers. I want you to sing. What would you like me to sing? Sing a song about me. Patrick paused a moment. Then he began to sing. The beast has a face so useful and round, with three eyes to make sure lost things are found, and two tongues for licking all it can find. The beast is quite clearly a one of a kind. Patrick stopped singing. He said he was sorry that it was such a short song and that he would be able to sing something a little longer once he got to know the beast better. The beast smiled, and that smile was wet with dribble. That was beautiful. Tell me, are there many little birdies like you? Oh, gosh, no. There are only 20 of us left in the whole world. How many beasts like you are there? <laughs> I'm the only one, the last survivor. It's good that you're rare. I like rare things. Come a little closer so that I can see you better, birdie. Ebenezer picked up the cage and brought Patrick closer to the beast's three black blinking eyes. Closer! <laughs> Even closer! Ebenezer dragged the cage so that Patrick was right in front of the beast's dribbling, stinking mouth. The stench of boiled cabbage that was now eye-wateringly strong. <laughs> Can you see me now? asked Patrick, a little nervously. Oh. oh, I could see you fine the whole time. The beast licked its dribbling mouth with its two black tongues. Then, then why did you need me to come closer? Asked Patrick. I am afraid to say that this was the last question that poor Patrick ever asked. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and hope you all have an awesome year. Hello Awesome Book Award readers, I'm Eve MacDonald and I'm the writer of this book, Else Time. Now obviously I like to write, but I also like to paint. But the one thing I love to spend my time doing is treasure hunting, just like Needle Lucket in Else Time. I love to walk along a river or perhaps the beach on the search for something sparkly, something special like this. Or perhaps maybe a little lost toy like this one down here. But one thing I always wish is that these little treasures could talk. Now, Needle fully believed his treasures could talk, and I'm going to read to you a part in the book where he shows Glory how he reads a treasure story. At this part of the story, it's about halfway through, they're hiding under a bridge um, from the police, and they are, um, Glory is in a bit of a bad mood, let's face it, and Needle is trying to cheer her up. Listen, Needle whispered and put a finger to his lips. Glory froze with pebbles balanced on her wooden hand and listened hard. What? Needle reached between them and pointed to a tiny disc of grey pressed down into the mud. He licked his finger, rubbed the disc until it shone and gently pushed down on it. The silver was so weak it relented and offered a quiet white pop. Glory gasped. Listen, Needle repeated. Carefully, he pinched its sides with his long nails and he pulled it up and up ever so slowly. Shmuck! 
It was a beautiful silver thimble, so fragile it could buckle from a feather's touch. Needle crawled to the river's edge and washed it. He stood up and placed it in the palm of his hand. Glory's jaw dropped. He had spoken of how he could tell a treasure story. She watched in silence as Needle closed his eyes and stuck out his chest. This thimble's owner be only a whippet of a thing, but whoosh this girl had clout, Needle began, waving his free hand over his head like a shooting star before placing it at the crook of his back. She and this thimble darned socks for a living, but with every stitch she be dreaming of bigger things. One day in church, she came to the rescue of a red-faced lady in waiting, sewing up her torn sleeve good and tight. And with every perfect stitch, it was worth one step on the ladder until at 15, she became the youngest ever mistress of the robes to wait for it, he whispered, only the king's mother herself. Glory squealed for the girl's success, but quickly hushed as Needle paused, concentrating on the deepening story. The girl was quiet, like a mouse, Needle said, but she had big ears. She'd be sewing royal secrets into every hem and cuff in that castle. Drop a stitch or a secret and she'd be out on her ear, she was warned. But she did. She dropped a secret, one that spared the life of the king's son and hung his royal traitor dead. Needle opened his eyes and placed the thimble on Glory's smallest wooden finger. She said little else after she'd told the secret, afraid her own would escape. Turns out she tore that lady in waiting sleeve herself. I'd like to have a cup of tea with her, he smiled. Well, it has been an absolute joy and a pleasure to be part of the Awesome Book Awards this year. Happy reading, everyone. Bye-bye. Please could you let us know who the winner of 2022 Awesome Book Awards is? It would be my absolute pleasure. Yes, I can't wait to find out. So, the moment of truth. I have here the golden envelope containing the name of the winner of the Awesome Book Awards 2022, and I'm going to open it. I can't wait to find out. Here comes the name, here comes the moment. I can't hear a drum roll, but I want you to imagine in your names the drum roll in your minds as I read out the name Jack Meggett Phillips for The Beast and the Bethany. Congratulations, Jack. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being a part of the Awesome Book Awards 2022. And our panel is already narrowing down the shortlist for next year's awards, which promise to be just as exciting as this. The shortlist will be announced in September. And don't forget, if you haven't already joined, go to www.awesomebookawards.com and register to be involved again next year.